Fano, welcome to the Infrastructure Sustainability Council Reconnect Conference of 2022, officially known as ISC. Um, first up, a few thanks to Gold, our Gold partner, Waka Kotahi, who have supported the ISC with today's event, but also yesterday's Infrastructure Sustainability Accredited Professional ISAP Day. Uh, a big thank you to Auckland Unlimited, who have provided support for this event. We love being in Auckland, and those of you who have travelled from across the ditch and around the country, we hope that you enjoy all that Auckland has to offer. Once you get up to the Sky Tower, for example, you can see it all rogue cones, as far as the eye can see. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. These works will improve our access to all that Tāmaki Auckland does have to offer. And so much of that beauty lies with Tangata Whenua and the stories of our land. Uh, this venue is a site of cultural significance, or rather that which lies below us, um, it is above the Waihora Tiu stream, also known as the Queen Street stream. It was an open stream starting out in the gully, which is now Myers Park, before flowing through a swampy area, now Aotea Square, and then down the centre of what was to become Queen Street. Records have it that the eels ran thick and the water pure, servicing both Māori and the first European colonists of Auckland. If you can imagine Tunamo, the yearling that went on, the waka that went down the waterways here, it was lush, it was beautiful, it was life-giving. But as settlement increased, the stream became an open sewer and was then bricked over around the middle of the 19th century. Water still runs into the old sewers under Queen Street where it discharges under the ferry building to the sea. It's a reminder of the need for balance, the power of our natural resources and of taking a sustainable approach uh, that preserves our tile, our environment, even as we continue to grow. And that's what this conference is about, of course, not just building things, but building community, honouring te tayao, and connecting more fulsomely and confidently to tangata whenua and te ao Māori values. By understanding the history of this place, we can have a reciprocal and thriving partnership that supports all initiatives going forward. And as our matua reminded us, Matariki couldn't be a more perfect time to do this, we're really blessed with the timing. Now we have a packed day ahead with sessions looking at place-based approaches to net zero, stepping beyond silos where we'll look at what sustainability leadership looks like for the coming decade, technology transformation, and the last session, Anchors for Action, is where we'll hear a series of quick-fire presentations on high-capacity cables that link to carbon-neutral data centres. We'll hear about Kofi Park and their renew renewable energy development and decarbonisation and wrapping up with a look at renewable energy zones. This event is all about engagement. We want to hear your questions and we want to hear your input. So if you haven't already downloaded the app, please do so. Uh, an email was sent out on Sunday afternoon uh, of how to do this along with your log and credentials. If you need assistance, please just talk to Tara who's sitting at this table here. Uh, actually, no, is Tara there or is she over at the AV stand? She's at reception at the moment, okay. Um, so she will be at the AV desk at the back of the room or reception. Uh, you'll need the app to submit any questions during our sessions. And don't uh, forget, of course, that we've got the Wholesome Ally Concrete Networking Dinner tonight. Uh, that is just one opportunity to get together. Networking, as we know, is so important in this industry. So we've replaced short morning and afternoon tea breaks and lunch with two one-hour networking breaks to maximise your catch-up times. Those are from 11 to 12 and again from 2 to 3. Coffee is available all day long, so please enjoy that. I'd like to introduce now Ainsley Simpson, the CEO, Infrastructure Sustainability Council, to formally kick off our day. Paki paki mai. Ainsley Simpson. E tarangatira, e nik, he mehi nui ki a koe, ten a koe. Ki a koutou katoa, he koe ten a koe. Koe tou toke tenei, kao papa, hira hira. Nō reira, e nā mana whenua, tena koutou, tena koutou, tena tātou katoa. Once upon a time, not so long ago, began a story of four seasons. Seasons of arriving, striving, surviving, and thriving. 
because seasons change, and so do we. Let's start with the arriving season. Born on the 29th of February 2012, the IS rating scheme was championed by industry for industry. It was co-funded by government, the private sector, and the council as a not-for-profit. It was developed by an interdisciplinary A team of subject matter experts, and I honour each and all contributors, including those here today, as well as those past who now walk beside us. This year we celebrated a decade of determination, our striving season, a decade in which we collectively invested to create not one, but two strategic assets for the infrastructure sector, the IS rating scheme and the, I, the Infrastructure Sustainability Council. Today, over $217 billion worth of infrastructure is now under rating. The scheme has expanded across all stages of the asset life cycle, and the benchmarks have shifted. The scheme is being deployed across Aotearoa, New Zealand, and every state and territory in Ahitiraria, Australia. In delivering, it is delivering a compelling return. Economically, the scheme is set to deliver up to $2.40 for every dollar invested, and that is only the monetized value. It does not include the substantial non-financial benefits. Very soon, we will be able to share with you more details that we have received significant funding to progress our important mahi. Work that will help us all see more readily the colours and changing of the seasons. Through the striving season, our organisation also transformed. We transitioned to the Infrastructure Sustainability Council, or the ISC. This acknowledged our vision, it is deeply aligned with our purpose, and it also recognises a promise that I made to all of you in May 2019. The impact we enable was central to the evolution of our new identity, but it honoured the change that collective progress has made, and it amplifies our ability to accelerate change through collaboration. It meaningfully and respectfully acknowledges your continued commitment and contributions, along with all of our member whānau and partners here in Aotearoa. Our brand remains anchored in a circle which represents what we do, how we do it and why we do it, because better never stops. It signifies that it's never too late to start and it doesn't matter where you start only that you get started. It encourages inclusivity, circularity, and resilience. And the four arrows represent all of the opportunities associated with infrastructure. The quadruple bottom line, the stages in the asset life cycle, the different kinds of infrastructure, and of course the benefits that infrastructure delivers. Social, cultural, environmental, and economic impact. All the while, there is the surviving story. We are living in a century of change. Globally, there have been simultaneous crises which signal this. COVID, climate change, social injustice, destabilizing geopolitics. None of these will be short-lived, and all of them leave in their wake devastation and destruction. Collectively, they have laid bare the inequalities in societies, inequalities that were already there. Fundamentals like the human right to health, as well as access to quality infrastructure and economic opportunities. On the bright side, COP26 and heading into COP27, the need for positive climate action has been reinforced. In moving to net zero and a positive future, it is best not to be myopic. We don't need a magnifying glass on carbon as our only metric. We also need binoculars for long-sightedness, for long-ranging impacts. That involves increasing resilience and adapted capacity, preparing our workforce through partnership for a just transition, 
all the while protecting and regenerating our natural ecosystems. You see, time is an illusion. The striving and surviving season are happening at the same time, as is our transition to the thriving season. Kamua kamuri, we walk backwards into the future. In the spirit of progress, there is much to learn. Traditional owners, Maori, Australian Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander and Pacifica peoples, they all have traditions, sacred traditions, which honour the responsibility of guardianship for the environment. That comes with it in the importance of intergenerational well-being. It is a responsibility, an obligation, that needs to be shared equally. Earlier this year, Just a moment. Hmm. We'll just keep going without those. Earlier this year, we partnered with the brilliant Kate Mayrick. And now my iPad's having a moment. A passionate urbanist and placemaker. She has deep experience in both hemispheres, and looking at a range of global literature and case studies, coupled with industry conversations across Australia and New Zealand, we started to answer three questions. What is a thriving nation? What is world-class infrastructure? And how do we bring these two together to enable transformative change? A thriving nation is fair, spatially and, in, and generationally. It enables hopeful solutions to challenges, local and global. It ensures inclusive access to opportunity. A thriving nation is for Tangata. It is for people. It is one in which everyone has the same opportunity to realize their best life, to meet their needs and achieve their dreams. A thriving nation has a common unifying purpose. Everyone has a part to play, and the benefits can be equally reaped and shared. A thriving nation cares about today's community equally. It also sets up future generations for success. It is resourceful, resilient, and responsible. A thriving nation can be defined by a pyramid, a pathway for understanding the progress that a nation is making, holistically against the foundation dimensions of resilience or responsibility and emerging attributes of resourcefulness. What was confirmed was that no one nation or place was a thriving nation. Each had different strengths and vulnerabilities. Across a range of indices, New Zealand, for example, brings strength in the areas of happiness, equity, environmental consciousness, and connectivity. Sustainability and innovation are areas of opportunity. Other countries like Australia and Canada, um, across these indices, don't perform as strongly as one might think. Countries like India and Estonia uh, had some of the most positive stories to tell. Why? Because a thriving nation is not an endpoint; it is a journey. And it's a journey that is defined by a different pathway based on that place's culture, strengths, and vision. Estonia, which is the poster child of our analysis, showcased the power of being driven by a single purpose united by people. In this case, it was leveraging digital technology. They leapfrogged to become one of the most digitally advanced nations on the planet, all to deliver greater economic, social, and environmental outcomes. And objectively, this success was understood through the changes in data points between 1991 and 2001. Their GDP per capita grew by 644%. High school completion rates rose 
to 90%. Life expectancy rose by 10 years, and carbon emissions per capita were halved. The United Kingdom, which also coupled technology investment with a clear ambition to reduce coal-generated electricity from 40% of all power in 2012 to only 2% last year. Taiwan, once nicknamed the garbage island, is now the second most efficient recycling system in the world because of infrastructure investment they made 20 years ago, with 2% of waste now going to landfill. And Singapore has treated its infrastructure investment as a national quest, becoming the most technologically advanced country in the world, with digital infrastructure being deployed and capacity being accelerated for innovation and value creation. Infrastructure is a critical driver of social progress, but also quality of life, resilience and productivity for our communities, our cities, our regions and our nations. It plays a fundamental, foundational, and catalytic role. Thriving nations are about people. So while conventional wisdom recognizes the importance of productivity and progress, the more enlightened approach places well-being and resilience of people and ecosystems at the heart of their decision-making. The impact of infrastructure investment is simultaneously immediate and long-term direct and indirect, helping communities to catch up and forge ahead. We know that infrastructure operating to a higher purpose can do more. More critically, suboptimal performance in any system compromises the integrity of the network. And infrastructure is a network of connected systems connective systems, supportive systems, natural systems, lifestyle systems, all enabling people to thrive. So this is a moment for bold thinking and decisive action, driving our sector towards a new era of world-class infrastructure. And what does world-class look like? Well, it has foresight and impact. It is the infrastructure of resilience, and it, me it drives measurable intergenerational value for everyone. Elegantly designed and creatively delivered, world-class infrastructure enriches daily lives and contributes to the greater good. It decarbonizes, it democratizes, it digitizes, and it decentralizes. But most importantly, it defines. Interconnected and human-centered, world-class infrastructure consciously addresses negative outcomes and captures the widest benefits possible for the greatest number of people over time. These outcomes only happen when cohesive policy interacts with data-driven decision-making and cross-sectoral collaboration. It is in its planning, procurement, funding, operations, asset management, and even decommissioning World-class infrastructure is intrinsically value-adding, not value-engineered. World-class infrastructure redefines fit for purpose. It means not just net zero, resilient, and inclusive infrastructure. It means infrastructure that is net zero, that enables net zero resilience and inclusion. Is it really good enough that we meet today's community's needs without compromising our ability of the future needs? Is now not the moment to commit to decision making that creates better, stronger legacy for today and all of our tomorrows? One that embraces kaitiakitanga. We have some barriers to overcome, but we can learn from the boldness of others through purpose, progress, people, and partnership. The purpose of infrastructure intervention is clear when it is well defined by social and environmental problems rather than generic nation building economic investments. It makes the impossible happen and transforms laggards to leaders within a generation. Infrastructure is serving the needs of community and it is the means but not the end in and of itself. And more importantly, partnership 
relies on multiple partners working together in a high trust environment for success. The United Nations confirms that infrastructure is responsible for 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions and 88% of adaptive cost. So if not now, then when? Over the next few hours, we are going to explore a whole range of issues which cannot be solved by one individual or one organization alone. This conference is a call to action. It is also a call for courage, and it is quite firmly a call for accelerated collaboration. Today, we set aside the misnomer that competition is the peer sitting beside you. The real competition is climate change and rising inequality. There is room for everyone in the table. Everyone has a role to play, and the faster that you share, the more benefits we will reap for today and all our many tomorrows. You are part of our past and you are part of our pathway. Let's step up, let's level up, and let's leave no one to behind as we move from a decade of determination into a decade of action. Let's make sure it's also a decade of dignity. Thank you. <laughs> I love that, a decade of dignity. Wonderful, thank you very much, Ainsley. What is a thriving nation, she asked. It's for people, for everyone to achieve their best life. It's resourceful and resilient. It's equitable and connected. It means better health, longer life for people, underlined with well-being and resilience at the heart of decision-making. And it really does underline how vital your mahi is. Um, what is world-class infrastructure? She asked, it has impact. It's the infrastructure of resilience. It adds value intrinsically. It isn't en engineered. It's not just net zero and inclusive, it enables it, it grows it. Uh, today's discussions will help enable action, courage and collaboration, as Ainsley said. Another round of applause, please, for Ainsley Simpson. Uh, we're going to move now to the Honourable Michael Wood, Minister for Transport, appearing via our live stream, and in brackets it says, hopefully. I'm always nervous about live streaming with ministers, but it looks like the minister is here. A round of applause, please, for the Honourable Michael Wood. Kia ora koutou katoa, good morning, and uh, really pleased that the uh, AV has worked this morning. Uh, it's not always the case. And can I also acknowledge Ainsley for her comments just before, which I, I caught most of as well. Really inspiring stuff. Look, I'm really thrilled to be here with you for this discussion today with a focus on how we decarbonise our transport infrastructure in the coming years. And I want to thank everyone who's in this room for the part that you're playing in making that happen here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. As I get around the country, there is a real sense of energy and purpose about the task that is ahead of us uh, over the next 10, 10 to 30 years as we undertake this challenge for our country and a real focus on the wide range of benefits that we can achieve. As we've just heard from Ainsley, um, we've got a mission in front of us to decarbonise our transport system. But if we do that well, we can improve life for people in New Zealand. We can have cleaner air. We can have more equitable outcomes. We can have reduced congestion in our major cities. We can open up opportunities uh, to education uh, and, uh, and, and work for people. Um, there is so much that we can achieve with a sustainable approach to delivering the kind of infrastructure that our country needs. I think you will all be aware of the scale of challenge that we face across the transport system. After agriculture, it is the second biggest emitter uh, of greenhouse gas emissions in uh, our country, around about 17% of gross emissions. What's even more difficult is that over the past 30 years, transport has been the sector that has had the worst trajectory. Our, our transport emissions have increased by between 90 and 100% over the past 30 years, largely led by an increase in our light vehicle fleet. And that is far and away the biggest increase of any sector over that period. And so in short, if we want to reach the targets that we need to meet, net zero by 2050, roughly halving that by 2035, we have to turn around uh, the transport emissions profile very, very quickly. And that's going to take significant work to achieve. The government's approach has been a sequential one. You might remember that in the previous term, 
we declared a climate emergency, which was a clear statement of intent from our parliament about the scale of challenge that, that is in front of us. We then followed that up with legislation, the Zero Carbon Act, which established the Independent Climate Commission, um, a model that provides us with independent scientific advice around what we need to do to re reduce our emissions across sectors. We've then followed that up with an emissions reduction plan, which is our government's response to the recommendations of the commission, breaking it down in five yearly carbon budgets and by sector to determine what we need to do with a comprehensive suite of actions to deliver those outcomes. And then at the budget this year, we've also announced the Climate Emergency Response Fund. That's the money that we're bringing in behind the emissions reduction plan to give life to the actions. So over the course of three years, we've moved from a statement of intent to a funded plan for how we reduce our emissions sector by sector. And of course, there's been a huge range of uh, discussion across communities and sectors, including with many of you, as to how we get there. Within transport, we've settled on a target of a 41% reduction by 2035. And we have four specific and very ambitious targets that we're going to need to meet if we want to get there. Uh, the first is to increase zero emission vehicles to 30% of the light fleet. So you see the work that we're doing through the clean car discount, the clean car standard, and other measures to drive that along. Secondly, reducing emissions from freight transport by 35%. And what's particularly interesting and encouraging about that target is that when we initially consulted with the freight sector, we had a lower target in place, and we received advocacy from the freight sector that they believe that we can go better and harder on that one. Thirdly, to reduce total vehicle kilometres travelled by 20% by 2035, and that involves a significant shift in terms of how people move around our communities, towns, cities and regions. And fourthly, reducing the emissions intensity of transport fuel by 10% by 2035. So each of those targets assume something about the world of the future that's supported by the infrastructure that we build now. So to reach those targets by 2035, the actions have to start now, and if the actions don't start now, the task becomes harder year on year. Uh, the infrastructure that we're going to need to create to deliver on those targets is vast and wide ranging. It involves the creation of mass rapid transit networks, efficient and effective public transport networks, the decarbonisation of public transport, a significant national charging network uh, to support the electrification of our vehicle fleet. Uh, and many other initiatives as well. So there is a real need for us to be investing in infrastructure now, and indeed our government is. Um, this is going to be a challenging journey. And one of the things that I say uh, to every audience when I talk about this is that it involves us doing things differently. The nature of transport is that every single day, virtually every person interacts with the transport system. You step outside your house, and whether your kids are going to school, you're going to work, you're doing the shopping, you're interacting with transport. And so on this journey, as we ask people to think about doing transport in a different way, we are asking people to change how they go about their lives. And that speaks to some of the challenges and tough conversations that we will have to have. But ultimately, it's the old axiom, if we keep doing the same old things, if we keep building the same old infrastructure, we'll get the same results that we've gotten up until now. And that is not the path that we can choose for the future and for future generations. And as we've heard from Ainsley, and as I've touched on, there are so many other good outcomes that we can achieve if we do things differently as well. Um, briefly, I just want to mention the carbon neutral government program, because one of the things that we have been very clear about is that um, the government itself needs to lead from the front. Um, we need to demonstrate um, that we are not just telling other people what to do. And we also need to be able to model and test out different ways of achieving decarbonisation within our own sector of the economy and society as well. So across a range of government agencies, including those I'm responsible for, um, we have instructed our agencies to measure, verify, and report on their emissions annually, to set clear gross emissions reduction targets and pathways to reach our, our goals by 2035 and 2050, and to start work now on implementing low carbon designs, building materials, and construction processes. And that's particularly important across our infrastructure delivery agencies, the likes of Kiwi Rail, um, uh, Waka Kotahi, Kayanga Ora, who are significantly engaged in the delivery of infrastructure and who I understand are in the audience here as well. So that's our, our, um, our pathway forward as a public sector. 
and we want it to be one that's instructive and helpful to people in the private sector as we partner up on this. Um, we have a significant infrastructure delivery program in pursuit of a range of goals, including decarbonisation, and it cuts across the entire transport portfolio. We have now decisively shifted away from the focus of transport 10 years ago, which was simply about building ever more roads across the country, to shifting towards a truly multimodal system that is based around decarbonisation and the benefits that it might deliver. So a range of different modes you now see significant investment going into. Mass rapid transit will shortly be making announcements on the next steps for MRT in the Wellington region. In Auckland, of course, we have work that is now underway on the Auckland Light Rail project and the next Waitamata Harbour crossing, which will be centred on mass rapid transit for the people of the North Shore. We have work underway to deliver an interim busway to the northwest. Work is funded for the next stages of the eastern busway, and we continue to extend the northern busway in the north, as well as making improvements to our rail network, including the electrification of rail to Pukekohe. So the goal there is to build an integrated and linked up trunk mass rapid transit network, which is what enables large numbers of people to make efficient journeys uh, around our growing biggest city, uh, that is Auckland. But of course, in addition to that, we need other infrastructure to support journeys as well. Um, so significant investment going into other mode shift initiatives. In the budget this year, $300 million was uh, allocated to a transport choices fund, whereby we'll be working with local government in, in, in the coming months to look at the quick look at the, for the quick stand up opportunities. What can we do to make sure that kids have got safe ways of walking or cycling to school? What are the opportunities for quick pop up busways in areas where we know that, that will incentivize people to get onto public uh, transport? What's the simple and easy stuff that we can do in, com in communities to send a positive message about getting on the bus? So there's funding there for 500 improvements to bus shelters around the country, for example, to send people that message that this is a quick, easy and pleasant way of getting around our cities. We continue to invest significantly in our rail network as well, with goals to lift um, rail's share of freight uh, delivery across the country. Um, we inherited a rail system that was on its knees after years of managed decline and invested over $7 billion over the past five years to build rail to be a resilient and reliable asset for our country. We've recently complemented that with $30 million of investment into coastal shipping with four new coastal shipping services joining us in a public-private partnership to move, move bulk goods around our country in an efficient, sustainable way that also builds the resilience of our freight system. And one of the really interesting initiatives in the budget this year was the additional investment that we've put into bus decarbonisation. And we're working very closely uh, with uh, local councils and bus operators on that challenge uh, to support the ambitions that we have to ensure that our bus fleet is entirely zero emissions by 2035 in the delivery of public transport. So a huge amount of work that is going on across the system uh, to make sure that the infrastructure we are delivering now meets our zero carbon goals into the future. We're also looking at the non-infrastructure um, investments that we can make that support people to make the shift. So you will have seen the investment that we've made in half price public transport as we deal with some of the particular challenges at the moment in terms of fuel prices. But beyond that, uh, $98 million of investment in the budget this year to set up the Community Connect card which will provide permanent half price public transport for people on the community services cards with, uh, with the lowest incomes in our country. That will benefit over a million people across New Zealand. Uh, we have also announced in the emissions reduction plan our intention to move forward with serious investigation into the possibilities of congestion pricing in our larger cities as well, which can be an important measure to leverage the best benefits out of the public transport investments uh, that we are making. One thing that I have become particularly conscious of in this role as we deal with a suite of large scale infrastructure projects though, um, is the degree of embedded carbon that we deal with whenever we move forward with large scale projects that involve a lot of steel and a lot of concrete. And, and, a, and a particular challenge that we face with this is the short term, long term challenge. We know that there is an urgent need to reduce our emissions and to do so by 2035 uh, in particular. Yet much of the heavy infrastructure that we're investing in to deliver these projects has significant amounts of embedded carbon uh, that mean the first 10 or 15 years often, um, we are still net carbon emitters 
before the benefits of people shifting to public transport or walking or cycling begins to overwhelm the embedded carbon. So I think this is a real issue and a real challenge for us to be working on with you. How can we be delivering the long-term infrastructure that we know will enable carbon reductions, but to do so in a way that is not so embedded with carbon in the first instance? And there is some very promising technology and research that's underway there, but I think it's something that we need to double down and partner with, partner with each other on uh, as well. Um, so folks, I'll, I'll conclude my comments there and say that I think this is an enormously exciting time. Periods of change always are. They're not always easy, but I, as I said, I see enormous energy all around the country when I have these conversations. And if we get this right, we will bequeath to future generations, not only a low carbon economy and society, but one that is better and fairer and cleaner to live in as well. So I certainly look forward to partnering with you in that work in the year and years ahead. And I'm now very happy to take any questions you have. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Big round of please. applause, please, for the Minister. So as the Minister said, uh, there is time for Q&A. Um, please pop those into the app and I will moderate those for you. We don't have a lot of time, so pop those in right now if you can. But let's start with this one. Uh, government procurement, Minister, is a lever which can scale impact of delivery of sustainable outcomes. Are you considering contractualising broader outcomes using tools such as the IS rating scheme? Thanks. A really great question. Um, government's procurement levers are vast. We procure, uh, depending on how you measure it, 40 to $50 billion worth of goods and services uh, every year. And it's a really important tool to drive a whole range uh, of really good outcomes. Um, so yes, we are looking for projects, particularly those over $15 million to be embedding the IS tool to be making sure that we are getting those outcomes. But I'll just say more broadly, I work closely with Minister Stuart Nash, who's our lead minister for procurement and his economic development portfolio. And he's leading a wide ranging work program in this area. Um, an approach that I'm particularly attracted to is one that's been advocated for by the Business Health and Safety Leaders Forum called the Thriving Infrastructure Approach. We're going to be specifically embedding this into the Auckland Light Rail project. It's based on the Zero Harm London Olympics, um, where for the first time in modern history, they built the infrastructure for the London Olympics without a single fatality. And they did that by embedding this approach and this care for their workforce from the very, very beginning. They embedded it in the responsibilities that directors and senior managers had. They embedded it in the reporting. They embedded it in the, in the procurement, um, in the um, contract um, arrangements that they had. They embedded it in the quantity surveying so that some of these outcomes that often end up being add-ons were there from the very beginning, whether it was health and safety and well-being, whether it was better environmental outcomes. And I think that's increasingly what we've got to move, uh, move our way towards, structuring this into the way that we do procurement and do business. Thanks, Minister. Uh, how is investor sentiment around long-term dividends and ESG issues such as carbon charging? Do you see this impact in government funding decisions uh, as early as business case? Um, yes, I do. And this is something that we are exploring. There is clearly um, significant uh, international and domestic interest um, in how we can finance and support projects that have a strong sustainability profile. Um, that's something Minister of Finance is looking at closely and it is something that will absolutely influence us at the business case stage as well. One of the pieces that I have under work at, uh, have underway at the moment is working with Waka Kotahi in terms of how we give life to the emissions reduction plan, which is now government policy, to make sure that it's clearly guiding projects and programs at the business, level, uh, business case stage. Great, thank you. We've got time for one more question. In light of the recent proposal in the EU to only allow the registration of light vehicles with zero emissions by 2035, what is the stance of the government on such a measure? Mm. Look, I've just come back from Oslo, where I was at EVS 35, which is the world's biggest uh, zero emissions vehicles uh, fair to um, connect with um, like-minded countries, manufacturers, and to try and source supply for New Zealand. Um, the good news is that we are storming ahead in this area at the moment. Um, under the clean car uh, discount policy, in April of this year, 20% of the vehicles coming into New Zealand were zero emissions, and we were closing in on 50% zero emissions uh, and low emissions. Um, outside of Norway, which leads the world by some way, we are now up to EU levels in terms of clean vehicles coming into uh, New Zealand as a result of those policies that we implemented 
only one year ago. So our policies are leading us in that direction. And what we have indicated is that we will give further consideration as to whether there is value in having some hard targets as we head into the 2030s. Thank you very much, Minister. We do have to leave it there, but appreciate your time this morning. Round of applause, please, for the Honourable Michael Wood. So the Minister, of course, talked about the uh, goal to decarbonise transport systems and the challenges ahead, given after agri agriculture transport is the biggest emitter of greenhouse emissions. We're aiming for net zero by uh, 2050, roughly half of that by 2035. Minister spoke to a lot of those projects, the clean car discounted standards, reducing freight emissions, admitting that we can go better and harder. Uh, the actions, of course, must start now, but we need to have difficult discussions and do things differently to bring people along uh, for this ride, so to speak, um, that we've moved from building more uh, roads to a complete decarbonisation picture, which includes rapid transit, uh, Auckland light rail, as we know, and bus systems, building an integrated and linked up network, allowing large numbers of people to efficiently travel. The need uh, is to move and act urgently. So another round of applause, please, for the Minister, Michael Wood, this morning. I'm going to move into our first session. I'd like to thank ACOM for their support with this. Uh, Craig Davidson, the Managing Director of ACOM, will provide an overview of this session, Thriving Nations Enabled by World Class Infrastructure, our Decade of Action. Please welcome Craig. Atamaria Itafano, it is great to be here together in person. I love the fact that we are getting together at events like this and it's coming back to normality. We are social beings and it's really important that we, we meet together and converse on these important topics. But that said, I want to acknowledge those online, particularly those outside of Auckland, and recognise that if we are to deliver on our sustainability aspirations, we need to reimagine how we travel and meet together as well. But that said, this is an exciting opportunity for us to get together. I love the theme of the conference, a decade for action for people, the planet and the economy. The challenges that we face in the infrastructure landscape are complex and directly impacts people's lives, their social, economic, health and wellbeing, along with the planet we live in. And it's the only planet that we've got, so we do need to look after it. But more critical, however, is the urgency for action. Time is not our friend. We've collectively kicked the can down the road for too long. As Ainsley said, the time for change is now, and that, ch that change needs to be integrated and transformational, driving a positive step change. But all that being said, I'm preaching to the converted here. After all, each of you have paid good money to be here. But being part of the converted means that each of us has a responsibility to not only fully understand the change required, and the means by which that change can be delivered. But we all have a responsibility to ensure that change is delivered. The infrastructure that we design and build, along the way with the ways that we can reimagine the use of existing infrastructure, has enormous potential to positively contribute to the sustainability challenge. At ACOM, our sustainable legacy strategy aims to give responsibility and opportunity to every employee to make a change a positive change in how we design and deliver infrastructure, maximising our handprint and minimising the footprint of the infrastructure we deliver. We're proud to be involved in this project, such as the City Rail Link, that we have going on next door, where our teams through great design have been able to significantly reduce resource consumption and embodied carbon, embracing technology to track material quantities throughout the project life cycle and working to maximise the efficiency of the mechanical and electrical systems to reduce the whole of life energy requirements. However, when we talk about infrastructure, we sometimes fall into the trap of leaving the sustainability conversation to too late in the project life cycle, limiting the transformational potential of the infrastructure, potentially leaving designers to put glitter on the proverbial. It's important that sustainability is considered and prioritise right from the outset. When we define the problem statement, through the business case life cycle, and ultimately through a whole of life design process. A great example of early consideration of the sustainability challenge in action is Auckland Transport and Wakatahi's Supporting Growth Alliance. A planned alliance 
focused on identifying and protecting the transport corridors required to deliver on Auckland's future growth needs. A key element of the Alliance is to deliberately facilitate a transformational mode shift out of cars to ensure delivery on the goals of significantly reducing carbon emissions and vehicle kilometres travels, delivering on the goals that Michael Wood talked about in his presentation. And while I'm encouraged by the fundamental shift in focus of the wider infrastructure industry to a genuine desire to, sac to tackle sustainability and climate change and use infrastructure as an enabler for broader positive social outcomes, I'm, I'm concerned by the increasing number of grey clouds on the economic horizon. These grey clouds could derail the progress that we are making. So despite these economic challenges, we need to ensure we keep the momentum for change going, as the long-term cost for not acting far outweighs any perceived benefits derived from short-term cost-cutting. But enough of me, and I'm mindful of time, and as you will all know, that Wakatahi, Local Government New Zealand, and the Ministry for the Environment have all been strong drivers for change in the infrastructure sustainability space. So like you, I'm looking forward to hearing what Nicole, Vicky and Susan have to share on the next steps their organisations are taking on the sustainability journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig Davidson, with uh, talking to our decade of change. Transformation needs to begin from the outset of the project, not during. Fantastic. I would like to introduce now, uh, but before I do that, don't forget to put your questions into the app so that we can moderate those after our speakers. Um, I'd like to introduce Nicole Rosie with a call to action, the Chief Executive Waka Kotahi NZTA. Big round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. Aku mihi nui ki a koutou, kei aku rangatira tēnā koutou katoa. I acknowledge the Honourable uh, Michael Wood, Minister of Transport, Ainsley Simpson, CEO of Infrastructure Sustainability Council, and my fellow speakers and chief of the executives, Vicky, uh, here today this morning, tēnā koutou katoa. The Irish have a way with words, and Irish businessman Niall Fitzgerald um, I've got the right slide up, has definitely proved it. Sustainability is here to stay, and we may not be. It's an excellent summation of the biggest challenge facing humanity in the 21st century. We have not been careful or diligent guardians of our home planet. If we were tenants and the earth was a rental home, we'd have been evicted a long time ago. We may have slept through our initial wake-up call, but thankfully we are now making the changes we need to maintain a habitable earth for future generations. Individuals, organisations, governments, every part of our society has a role to play in the push for a sustainable world, and Wakatahi is no exception. Our transport system, as you've actually just heard from Minister Wood, is a major source of emissions and infrastructure. Um, we build become comes with very high emission costs. We want to support uh, our future generations by driving more sustainable outcomes and innovations now. This is a hugely important change as we design and deliver improvements to the transport system with our partners. At Wakatahi, we are aware of the important role we have in caring for the environment and are working hard to improve what we do and how we do it. Tuatu Te Taio, our sustainability action plan, was released in 2020, setting out our sustainability vision. We are striving for a low carbon, safe and healthy transport system and are committed to working with the sector to provide for improved cultural, social, economic and environmental outcomes. Our sustainability vision net is cast widely to reflect the national and global challenges we face. We need to mitigate emissions related to the land transport network and respond to climate change. The target is, is huge. 30 30 to 40% reduction in 10 years' time. Help provide better public health outcomes as MOTIF delivers a drop in pollution levels. Reduce environmental harm through protecting and, where possible, enhancing our indigenous biodiversity, water quality, providing for uh, resource efficiency using less virgin materials, reducing energy consumption and use of water. Recognise the important role of the transport system in, in shaping places for people and their environment that serve multiple purposes. And recognise respect and uphold to Te Reti of Waitangi, 
the partnership with Māori to improve sustainability outcomes. The public conversation often centres on emissions reduction, awareness and action in that area is vital. We are working towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions as part of our role in delivering the Emissions Reduction Plan, otherwise called the ERP, and as part of the requirements under the Carbon Neutral Government Programme. This includes reducing vehicle kilometres travelled, VKT, by light vehicles, and reducing emissions from freight transport. As the land transport system leader, planner and investor, we are carefully scrutinising our investment profile to ensure what we fund best delivers and supports these goals. Increasing investment in areas that provide people with better travel options or that make it easier to move around our network are key for sustainability success. Digital offerings like the national ticketing system, and NTS, and camera network give us new choices and encourage mode shift and transport choice. Investment in mass transit, which the Minister just spoke about, let's get willing to moving, Auckland Light Rail, and we are planning for better mass transit in our regions. This increases options and provides ease of travel. We're making major investments in better walking and cycling options with a view to creating a connected network that provides people choice and gets people where they want to go. We're also changing the way we use our network and transport corridors. Living streets, speed changes and traffic calming are making room for people as well as vehicles. All these have positive spin-offs for the environment in terms of sustainability goals. I've just mentioned reduced emissions, better public health, and the creation of a more cohesive community with better amenity. We're not just changing what we invest in, but the way we prioritise it. Our intervention hierarchy looks to implement behavioural change first, seeking to maximise the use of our networks using a number of methods, including reallocation of road space, and investment in mode choice. These solutions are not one size fits all. Our rural communities have very different needs from our urban communities. Much of our climate investment is targeted at urban areas because that's where most people are and by default where we can make the greatest reduction in our emissions. In our urban areas, we're reallocating road space, delivering mode shifts and looking for VKT reduction. That's vehicle kilometres travelled. The issues in rural New Zealand are different. Single route reliance and network resilient to climate change is a real concern. I've just been on the east coast in Gisborne in the major washout there, and there is only one state highway, um, State Highway 35 in Gisborne. So resilience and climate change adaption is a significant issue for New Zealand. We also have to be mindful of the role of transport in getting vital goods and supplies to markets and locally to geographically dispersed and often economically disadvantaged communities. We have a responsibility to all New Zealanders to maintain equity of access to the land transport network and the distribution of wealth that flows from that. The role of partners and iwi is crucial in ensuring this change focus works for everybody and that the dual outcomes of sustainability and economic success are achieved. We are asking New Zealanders to behave differently and think differently about how they travel and creating the social licence we need to do this is a huge task. We all know that we cannot continue to live as we have done and most of us are in agreement that change is required. However, often when we say something must be done, we really mean something must be done but not by me, please. Just need to look at my social media feed to realise that. I suspect that while we all want good climate outcomes, it's going to be challenging when it affects our choice and convenience and when it comes with personal cost. This will be a shift over time and it will not be easy. It will require ongoing discussion, engagement and adaption to ensure we build cities and communities of the future based on what communities we want and need, what communities want and need. Alongside all of this are our moves to reduce the embodied emissions associated with developing and maintaining the land transport system. This includes in our projects. That was a great question that was just asked earlier. The adoption of roading-specific sustainability rating tools has been critical in formalising our commitment to sustainability within our projects. It has helped us demonstrate a tangible commitment to driving sustainable best practice and improved our environmental performance and outcomes. We've been using the ISC rating tools since 2020. It can be used for a wide range of infrastructure types and asset life cycle phases. 
It has also brought with it several added benefits, a strong local network and community of practice, organisational resourcing, and the ability to support Wakatahi and our projects. Through using the tool, we have started to achieve a better understanding of our state highway environmental, social and economic outcomes and how they rate against an international framework. It has also helped us achieve broader outcomes, including raising awareness of the benefits of developing a more sustainable land transport system among our industry partners and along the supply chain. There has been spin-offs for business case management. The ISC planning assessment tool enables projects to consider sustainability criteria in business case decisions and prepare the foundations for integrating sustainability requirements in the design and construction phases. It's interesting, the Minister talked about the London Olympics exactly the same concept, it's uh, sustainability by design. This helps us potentially recognise greater benefits, provide for pro improving carbon outcomes and also better environmental sustainability outcomes at the lowest cost at the beginning of a project. Sustainability is a must-have on all our major projects. All new projects over 100 million are required to achieve an infrastructure sustainability certification. Our smaller projects uh, also need to demonstrate sustainability. They have to align with Wakatahi environmental policy strategies and standards, including those outlined in Tuatu Te Tarao, and our resource efficiency and waste minimisation policy. Some smaller projects have also adopted the ICS essential rating, which is currently being piloted. We have 13 projects registered or about to be registered for ASC sustainability rating. This is a significant achievement in itself, given that we only adopted ISC less than two years ago. Many of these are within the New Zealand Upgrade Program, which has set the bar high for seeking an excellent rating as the minimum sustainability level, thus demonstrating our commitment to sustainability. We are building our relationship with industry and with IC SC partnering to allow for better delivery outcomes all around. This includes health and wellbeing improvements through increased walking and cycling, better economic and social performance by increasing foot traffic and providing greater street space for businesses. Accessibility and equity have also been increased through more effective multimodal travel options. We have a strong focus on the development of genuine partnerships with mana whenua, using these opportunities to shift the narrative and leverage these changes to create better cultural outcomes and growth. The old Mangari Bridge replacement project here in Auckland is about to open, offers an interesting example of the sort of work we're doing in health, wellbeing and cultural space. Conceived more than 10 years ago and almost ready to open, the new bridge is an expression of how sustainable principles were acknowledged and delivered through planning, design and construction stages. New walking and cycling project is a great example of sustainability early thinking in action. The design of the bridge arch symbolically links the maonga on either side of the Manukau harbour. The addition of the fishing bays recognises the community desire for the bridge to continue to be a place to fish from, not just a means of getting across the harbour. There's a heritage garden established using recycled pieces of demolished 100-year-old bridge and locally sourced heritage trees. Artworks designed by Manawa Whenua reflect the rich cultural values of many iwi associated with the area, while the stories by local school children etched into the bridge, deck and furniture represent the future. Going forward, our commitment to sustainability is bolstered by a number of initiatives. There's no one thing that will make it successful, rather it's a number of things working together to help us get the best possible outcomes. We're working closely with our partners to reduce transport emissions through the urban growth agenda and the national and regional mode shift plans. We're contributing to an EV infrastructure plan and helping with the implementation of the climate change priority in the 2021 government policy statement on land transport. We are also making significant investment in walking, cycling and public transport infrastructure to support mode shift. In 2021, we doubled the kilometres of walking and cycling improvements that were delivered compared to previous years, and over 500 kilometres have been added to the network over the last five years. It's to propose to increase this in the coming years. As part of the government's broader outcomes and procurement initiatives, we are also considering not only whole-of-life cost of procurement activities, but also the cost and benefits to society, the environment and the economy. We recognise the importance of Te Ao Māori and our sustainability journey and the connection to the environment. 
We are starting work on a measure to help us understand how effective our partnerships and engagement with Māori are. We look to mana whenua to help us on this journey and appreciate and respect their insight and knowledge. In conclusion, this is the story so far. There are many chapters to come. We're up for the challenge, and as you can tell, we are now building our capability and understanding, including the value of the ISC rating framework, which we are stretching ourselves with further. We are looking at how we can bring sustainability thinking and possibly even formal sustainability rating into our business cases earlier. This should set a platform for sustainability success right from the outset. Our extended vision is a transport sector that integrates sustainability and it becomes an intrinsic part of what we do. We need you, our colleagues and the industry partners to work with us to achieve this. What we do today takes us a step closer to a successful and sustainable future. We look forward to working with and alongside you on the next steps in this essential journey. Ora ki nā rangatina tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. here just so that you can use those microphones um, over there. We've got some questions for you. Um, so the first one is Minister Wood highlighted the key targets for decarbonisation of the ve vehicle fleets and reduction in VKT. How much do you expect Waka Kotahi uh, current plans to contribute to these targets and how much remains? Yeah, um, well obviously we're at the early stages of the reset I guess in terms of investment prioritisation. And uh, the Minister said it's a staged approach, and this stage is really about setting the system up for the change that is happening. So whilst the investments at this stage haven't significantly changed the bar on VKT and other outcomes, they are the platform for us to do that. So I think we're, we're on the start of a journey. It is a very, very ambitious journey. Uh, in order for Auckland, which will harry, carry the heavy weight on the VKT reduction to achieve that reduction, people would have to use their vehicles 40% less. You mentioned planning for urban form to reduce travel demand. Uh, is there a linkage to increasing density of housing around bus routes and rail connections to increase use? Absolutely, and uh, certainly uh, Wakatahi uh, sees the urban form and shaping component of uh, the work that is occurring in local government as the most critical enabler of transport choice and change by um, intensifying um, people around transport nodes you, and giving them alternate options, you do provide the option for people to get out of their vehicles. Um, and so urban form, urban shaping, and uh, what happens in the space of how we create our cities is one of the key and biggest enablers to changing the way we move. What actions are being taken to reduce emissions and long-term environmental impacts of existing projects or projects currently underway? It's quite a broad question. I wonder if we narrow that down to uh, one project um, and one or two key actions. It is a really uh, big question. Um, you know, for context, we had 350 to 500 projects, depending on how you define a project on the go at any one time, as Wakatahi or our supply chain. Um, so, uh, you know, on our big ones, like the Upgrade Program, which is a significant $8.6 billion program of work, we have outcome uh, measures defined, which include very, um, yeah, very clear measures on sustainability, and each of those projects is working towards delivering those outcome measures. On a, at a day-to-day -day level, uh, strategically, Wakatahi has made it clear through Te Kapahu, which is our strategic reset, that sustainability is a core outcome that the organisation will drive in everything we do. And uh, what that means is every piece of our business is inherently focused on looking at sustainability outcomes as something they measure and what they do. And if you go and talk to a person in Wakatahi, I think you'll find that any one of them can talk to you about their, how they're thinking now about sustainability, whether it's looking at replacing concrete bridges with wooden bridges, or whether it's just actually looking at how we deal with the very complicated question of reallocation of our networks and balancing equity and access with um, the desire for mode shift, it is on everybody's mind and it's a constant point of focus and attention for the organisation. 
You mentioned that the role of iwi is crucial. We talked about the Waihoro Tiu uh, stream story this morning, which was great, and I was able to check that with our matua this morning as well. Uh, Waka Kotahi does um, engage with mana whenua. How do you do that? How do you make sure that that's an authentic and, and genuine process? Yeah, I think there's multiple, multiple levels of engagement. So to Tiriti, the partnership with Māori is about engagement at the level of setting of strategy and investment choice. And I think we are in the process of working together on how we do that. Where we've been excellent is at a project level. So, uh, I mean, iwi would be better to say whether that we're excellent or not, but we have won a number of awards uh, for partnering through our alliance structure with our uh, supply chain, with mana whenua, iwi in our um, projects. And in many cases, they are brought to the table to literally design um, and, and be part of the decision about how that project um, progresses. And we also advance uh, local economic activity through those projects as well. So um, it is really about sitting at the table as, a, as an equal partner and contributing at the strategic level. And I think that we will mature as a nation um, in this area over the next, um, next few decades, but certainly we have seen it as a critical part of our delivery success in New, in New Zealand. And then more broadly, uh, you know, we need social licence, we need communities to get on board. <clears throat> of course, we know that, um, as you said, people do believe that there needs to be change. They don't necessarily be, want to be the ones doing it. How do you bring people along on that ride? Uh, I have to say that's one of the biggest challenges for us. Um, the 88 people that are referred to as our comm staff, uh, 50 of those are community advisor and liaison people supporting communication and social engagement with communities around why we're doing walking and cycling, why some of these changes are important for their communities, and also connecting with those voices that are not heard very loud. So if I say there's not a loud voice from children in this discussion about transport, there's actually not a loud voice about from women, parents of children, in this voice on transport. Uh, the voice of mana whenua is sometimes heard, not, not that loud. And so um, social licence comes in many forms, and part of it is engaging with those communities that are actually most impacted or most benefit from the changes that we are, are making. And at the moment, the, the, the loudest voice is the voice that often gets the most attention um, and time in New Zealand, and that's not the voice of all New Zealanders. So I would say it's a very, very challenging um, situation. We're very polarised as a country. Um, the, the people on the edges are the voices that are the loudest. The media quite likes those voices, and so they are amplified. And uh, we are really playing in, in trying to bring whole communities along. So it is absolutely critical for us to build social licence. We, we only deliver what our communities want, but actually bringing out that full community voice is also very challenging. Absolutely. So I think it, it, it's going to continue to be a big challenge for us, particularly as the people that have controlled our system are losing what has been the centre of their, um, you know, people that like to drive fast. Um, it's a key part of our cultural ethos in New Zealand. It's absolutely at the heart of what we think is related to productivity. It's actually completely wrong. Um, it's a false uh, economy that we've all been convinced about. But, but, but actually, it will take us... We've, we've all learnt that from our parents for 20 or 30 years. It's not going to change overnight. So it's going to take a lot of education, a lot of engagement, a lot of reinforcement evidence-based for us to start to actually realise that some of the information that is out there um, about why we might be doing climate, why we might be doing safety is really good and rep represents what actually New Zealanders want when you talk to all New Zealanders. So I think it's challenging, but it's probably the biggest challenge in all of this. We're trying to change while New Zealand, and I would say a majority of New Zealanders, are still not quite there yet. Yeah, a bit of a path ahead. Uh, we'll leave it there for now, but thank you very much. Nicole Rosie, Chief Executive, Waka Kotahi. I really loved uh, what Nicole said first. If we were tenants in the world as a flat, we'd have been evicted a long time ago. I was thinking if there was a tenancy tribunal in the picture, who would that be? Maybe it's you guys. Uh, and of course, as Nicole had up on the screen, sustainability is here to stay or we may not be. We're not fighting for the planet. We're actually fighting for ourselves <clears throat> and our ability to remain on this planet. Um, so, a brilliant talk. Thank you very much, Nicole Rosie. We're going to move now to Vicky Robertson, Secretary for the Environment, 
uh, Ministry for the Environment, uh, to talk about what the next decade looks like, what should it look like, what should it look like rather. Um, this is our decade of action towards a low carbon, climate resilient economy. Please welcome Vicky Robertson. In a mana in a reo in a iwi tenakoto ka tua, ro langa terama ite iwi iti fano, ki aki nui ki aki rahi ihoma, na mihi nui a katoa, tina hui hui tato katoa. Well, it's great to be here today, and thank you, Ainsley, uh, for inviting me. Um, I feel like we're breaking out in wild agreement, um, which is uh, concerning, of course, but um, great to see never, nevertheless. Um, thank you also for resuming the conference. Uh, it's great to see people in person, as you said, uh, Craig, uh, but also to get together and talk about uh, what does the next decade look like. During the lockdowns of 2020 and 21, uh, we really valued uh, Aotearoa New Zealand's infrastructure services in a way that probably wasn't uh, uh, visible to people before, just like our essential workers. The supply of energy uh, and water to our homes, the delivery of goods and emergency travel, our supply chains, our digital connection with the rest of the world, all became visible as incredibly important to all of us. And we all depended on infrastructure uh, that your profession provides. It's interesting, uh, Mark Carney, who is the former governor of the uh, Bank of England, talks about uh, the, the comparison between COVID and what came forth there in terms of what we value and the approach to the climate crisis. And he, and he says uh, how we address the climate crisis will be a test of these values. Uh, after all, climate change is an issue that involves all of us around the world. It's one that no one can self-isolate self from. Uh, it is uh, based on science to be one of the central risks of tomorrow. And we can only address it if we act uh, in advance and in solidarity. He goes on to say that climate change is the ultimate betrayal of intergenerational equity. It imposes costs on future generations that the current generations have no direct incentives to fix. Uh, the beauty of uh, the conversation today with you uh, and aligns with us is that you are focused on the future. You have to be, because you need investment certainty over the lifetime of what you're involved in. We need investment certainty in investing in the environment as well for our future generations. So really pleased to see the themes of the conference. I wish you well in those conversations uh, and talking through how do we move forward. I'm going to get into the boring detail of some other things that are happening. You've heard a little bit today on the emissions reduction uh, plan. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what's happening uh, at the central government level, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, how much the pace of change is moving. Um, uh, my, my, Minister Michael Woods talked about the foundational works that, that's being put in place, so the Climate uh, Response Act, uh, the Climate Commission, uh, the need to uh, have an emissions reduction plan under legislation, uh, the need to set emissions budgets under legislation. So all these things will hopefully create uncertainty uh, over cycles of elections. Uh, really foundational stuff. Um, there is also a number of other areas that we are moving into building the base foundations. Adaptation is one of those, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. How do we adapt to the impacts of climate change we're already seeing? Uh, Tarafiti uh, and, and the road are there. What do we do? Do we rebuild the road? What else is needed there? Uh, and we also know the intensification of the climate impacts across New Zealand will be felt in different ways across New Zealand and will be uh, the distribution of that to uh, our people will be felt differently. Uh, particularly uh, for, uh, for Māori, it will have uh, dis a, a, a distributional impact that is uh, quite severe. The reduction of emissions alongside adaptation remains really important. We have to bend the curve in the pace of rising emissions. So I'll talk a little bit more about that and add on to what you've heard today around the emissions reduction plan. And then finally, if you haven't heard, there is a big reform going on in the resource management system. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So first to the uh, draft adaptation plan. Uh, under legislation, this is required, the government is required to do two things. One is to uh, bring out a, a, a risk assessment, national risk assessment, and, and then to 
develop up a national plan to address those, uh, those risks. In 2020, that risk assessment was uh, published, and we're now in the process of doing the uh, adaptation plan. We've just uh, consulted on that plan, and, and government will come out and publish that in August. So uh, the risks, uh, as you know, coastal ecosystems, community wellbeing, pot potable water supplies, buildings. Uh, the challenge uh, is made harder by our institutions, our practices and tools, which don't take account for uncertainty and change over long timeframes. The risk also is that there will be inequities, inequities, as I said, for communities and especially Māori, whose communities are more often coastally located. It also has impacts for our economic our well-being as well. Uh, our primary production areas will be impacted in terms of their climate uh, impacts uh, with uh, increasing rainfall in some areas, drier areas uh, where we um, uh, perhaps grow wine now might be coming increasingly wet areas, for example. Uh, we all know this. Um, as somebody else has said, the move to action is, is the harder part. So what the adaptation plan tries to respond to this, these risks and says over the next six years, uh, what will we focus on? It has a mix of current and proposed actions and, and programs, and it ranges from supplying access to information, how many people around New Zealand are really aware of the climate risk to where they live right now, getting more so, um, uh, but you know, there's probably a long way to go there. Uh, to supporting climate resilience and community housing, developing Matauranga Māori climate indicators, for example. There are three broad, broad areas in that plan. One is to ensure our legislation and system support and strengthen our work to adapt. And you will know that there are many of our legislation doesn't talk to each other. Uh, so there is quite a big program of legislative change that would need to be undertaken, including the resource management reform, uh, uh, around emergency management, water services and managed retreat that needs to actually talk across each other. And the role of local government in that is really critical too. The second area is around that uh, data information and guidance uh, to enable everyone to access and assess their own risk and to reduce their own climate uh, impact, uh, risks. Um, and all New Zealanders, we know, will have to adapt to the impacts of climate change. So that providing clear and accessible data and information to people, uh, families, whānau, iwi and communities at that level is really important. The third area is just embedding climate resilience across all government strategies and policies, and I'd say we're at the start point of that. So while all these are strongly connected, uh, two of particular interest to this audience will be in homes, builders, buildings, places and infrastructure. Actions in that space will be partly to understand the climate impacts, uh, but also options for climate resilient housing, developing guidance and frameworks for development and construction, incorporating, incorporating adaptation in funding models for urban and Māori housing, and supporting kaitiaki to conserve their tonga and cultural assets. For infrastructure, the goal is simple. Reduce the climate-related vulnerability of all our telecommunications, transport, energy, waste, cultural and social infrastructure. Simple. Not so simple. But that's the, that's the goal. The actions around that that are included in the plan at the moment are potential resilience standards, codes for infrastructure, developing a methodology for assessing climate impacts on infrastructure, progressing the rail network investment program, embedding adaptation into funding models, and treasury decisions concerning development and infrastructure, and also implementing the Wakatoki Climate Change Action Plan. The other area that's really important is managed retreat, uh, and it's one of the most complex and potentially disruptive areas of adaptation, and we're already seeing uh, um, initial responses to managed retreat around the country. But it's only an option that should be used when there are no other suitable options available. And nonetheless, it's an area that's considered to be where there are intolerable risks for climate change impacts. The only option can be a carefully planned and managed movement away of houses, activities, and sites of cultural significance. You can imagine what the impact of that would have on those communities. These sorts of questions about the cost, who bears the risk, what the role of insurance, the levels of responsibility, uh, all needs to be uh, uh, sorted out. Uh, later in, uh, well, in 2023, as part of the resource management reform, the government intends to introduce a Climate Adaptation Act, which is around managed retreat. 
um, and it's a key action that is included in the draft adaptation plan. That policy work is just um, underway at the moment. The second area that's important, which we've talked a lot about today, is the emissions reduction plan. So this is the plan for how do we meet the budgets that the government has set. Um, so the first, first thing I would say is the budgets go over three uh, five-year periods to 2035. The first budget, uh, therefore, uh, we have to achieve in 2025. That's not far away. Uh, and what we do now will actually set us up for reducing emissions in the second and third budget periods. Those budgets are agreed by um, government, but also have cross-party support. So we expect those to remain in place uh, over election cycles, which is good news. That first budget requires 290 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, to be reduced between now and 2025. So uh, feeling like we need to get our skids on. Um, many people have said the emissions, uh, budget is, um, emissions reduction plan is a plan for a plan, uh, and that is probably accurate. Uh, there are some things that we don't have a plan for. For example, how do we provide the energy required for the electrification of vehicles? We need to have a plan across uh, the whole energy uh, area, not just uh, electricity. So we need to do some planning. Let's not take too long to do it, is probably what I would say on that. Um, uh, the other thing uh, that uh, you talk, heard a lot about the transport part of the uh, emissions reduction plan, but also covers all other se sectors of uh, the economy, so agriculture um, uh, as well uh, and uh, other areas. So have a look at that plan. Um, it is about creating a smooth transition, uh, and uh, I suppose as we run out of time, it gets less smooth. Um, but the, the idea is that we do create a smooth transi transition and invest in things that we need to today in order to make that easier for tomorrow. Um, the ERP also uh, plan also recognises a really important role of price uh, and the ETS, and that is that our most powerful tool. Uh, and uh, that in order to get pace of change, that there is complementary measures. Uh, so you see quite a big investment from government uh, through the uh, SURF or the Climate Emergency Response Fund that the Minister talked about. And in order to get pace of change happening uh, uh, in this first budget period uh, and into the second. So the, the, the thing I would say about the Climate Response Fund is that is really unusual uh, for a Treasury to agree to hypothecate a tax uh, apart from enroding, uh, to then have a separate budget around climate. So the significance of that is um, really important, and that it will be on enduring, uh, that there will be investment from government uh, over time through the hypothecated tax of ETS revenue. Uh, it's not something Treasuries like to do, so it's an, a really uh, strong signal about that future investment. Uh, governments also will start to say, well, how is the private sector investing as well? So what's the balance between these things? Uh, and the balance between price regulation and investment uh, in total. So those are important to keep in mind. But for this uh, budget, budget the, uh, well, over the, for, for the fund itself, it's 4.5 billion that's in that fund. The first budget is 2.9 billion. And the minister talked a little bit about some of the things that are in there. Other things that are in there that you might be interested in, um, apart from de decarbonising uh, transport, is the decarbonising of uh, industrial process heat and the process energy sector, uh, the energy uh, work in terms of uh, energy strategy, hydrogen roadmap, and a regulatory framework for offshore wind energy. Uh, there's also um, uh, quite a bit in there around waste infrastructure and composting facilities, transfer stations and all of the waste area. The waste part of the emissions reduction plan is became, has become really critical. They are now um, responsible, they, us, <laughs> uh, for an 11% reduction uh, in, in um, methane emissions uh, through the waste sector. So quite a lot of responsibility into that area. The circular economy and bioeconomy is also a big part of what I would say we're at the start line of. There's some great projects going on in New Zealand, but it's an enormous opportunity. To Craig, to your point about grey winds on the horizon for our current economy, this is the enormous op opportunity for that transition to where we have a, a quite a strong comparative advantage as New Zealand. 
Um, so uh, a study actually uh, uh, commissioned by Sustainable Business Network estimated that a more circular economy in Auckland alone could reduce emissions by 2.7 metric tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, and add $8.8 billion in additional economic activity by 2030. Uh, Scion estimates the bioeconomy could create an extra $30 billion for our economy and help reduce emissions by uh, 12.5 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent by 2030. So quite some, quite some opportunity in there. The uh, EIP uh, talks to uh, having a circular economy and bioeconomy strategy, um, again a strategy, but also that will take us to some actions that will be first steps uh, towards that. It re will require us to have skills and infrastructure we need along the right regulatory and alongside the right regulatory and business environments, <coughs> and to support industry-led programmes such as Nawa Innovation and Enterprise Park in Northland. This uh, is an example where ex-dairy land has been converted into business, manufacturing, horticulture, innovation district, built on circular economy principles, including the recycling of bio-waste for energy, fertiliser and compost. Um, so finally, uh, the resource management system. So uh, most of you probably have had some interaction with this system in the past. Yep. Uh, and I think uh, everyone we talk to agrees that it hasn't worked for anybody, uh, including the environment. Uh, it hasn't worked for developers. It hasn't worked for housing. Uh, so uh, after 30 years and it being um, tweaked with every year for the last 30 years, uh, the government has... Um, uh, decided to reform that system. So this follows an independent uh, panel led by Tony Rannison um, about four years ago now, where they gave a 500-page uh, report to the, the government around what should be done in order to uh, do better for uh, those uh, dual objectives. Uh, and in early 2021, the government announced that its intention to repeal the Resource Management Act uh, and replace it with three new pieces of legislation the Natural and Built Environments Act, a Spatial Planning Act, and as I talked about, the Climate Adaptation Act. The first of these two acts will be introduced later this year. Uh, so we're well on the way uh, to, um, to those new, new parts of the system. Um, what I would say about it, because it is very complex and it's just about done my head in, uh, <laughs> in terms of the amount of work, so we've had a thousand, a thousand decisions made by ministers, we've had a group of about 17 ministers uh, overseeing this work, uh, and uh, it is uh, kind of moving towards introduction, so uh, a significant piece of work. It aims really to shift the system from uh, 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 basically an effects-based system to an outcome system with environmental limits. Uh, where and a, a second shift is really about moving from a lot of decisions being made at the consenting level to uh, planning, playing a key role in getting strategic planning done properly so that, con that, the, that consenting becomes less of a, an issue uh, and it's not done all through the consenting part of the framework. Um, one of the things, uh, so the Natural and Built, Environments, uh, Natural and Built uh, Environments Act is a replacement for the Resource Management Act. It's the Environmental Act. It will have a new purpose. It will have a treaty clause. Uh, it will have a different way that uh, planning is done at the local level. So local government and mana whenua will be required to develop uh, environmental plans um, that covered, covers regions. Uh, and that these will cover what you would expect in plans. So it brings together districts in that way. The, thing, the other thing that's really important, I think you might be interested in, the spa is the Spatial Planning Act. So this is a, a function that doesn't exist in the system in a co co coherent way or a consistent way across New Zealand. And it brings together central government, local government, mana whenua, to do regional spatial strategies. So the point about uh, urban form uh, and how transport uh, connects with how you plan for education, uh, how you uh, uh, work into your communities, uh, some of that will be done through these uh, regional spatial strategies with a 30-year time frame. The other thing you might be interested in is uh, one of the failures of the Resource Management Act was it wasn't implemented uh, in a coherent way from a central government point of view. So there wasn't enough national direction in the beginning. Uh, the uh, Randerson panel recommended that we pull together all the national direction and get some consistency and, and coherency around that and bring it together in a, in a framework. Um, that, that is part of the system. It's uh, called the National Planning Framework, and that will be stood up uh, as, as these things are uh, passed. 
The, the key point about that is all existing natural, national direction will transfer across. However, there is, will be a new piece of tra uh, national direction around infrastructure. And T. Y. Hunger is actually helping us develop that piece of uh, uh, national direction. What we expect that to include is a nationally consistent planning and technical standards for infrastructure that should be used in all plans and consenting decisions. Um, it might list actions, for example, uh, in uh, standards for erosion uh, and sediment control, just as an example. Councils can then state which standards they, they will meet uh, in their areas. Um, so I think that's an important piece of work uh, and goes to the objective of, of um, making a more efficient system uh, and more uh, effective for, for developers as well. So in conclusion, um, great to see that uh, you're, you're all on the start line uh, with us uh, around uh, action for the next decade. Uh, the emissions reduction plan is for all of us uh, and we need to work together with you uh, and with our treaty partners, Iwi Māori and the rest of society to make it happen. Uh, what I do know is that it's, uh, we won't know what the, all the answers are, so there is an adaptive and agile part of this. Uh, and from a central government point of view, uh, we are uh, actually pulled together a new accountability mechanism at the, client, uh, the CE's level. So uh, there's a prime ministerial-led climate change ministers group and then a board uh, which is, has the equivalency of a normal board under the Public Service Act of a group of uh, CEs who are accountable for the delivery of the plan uh, to the Prime Minister. So quite a shift in accountability at our end too. So great to see you uh, all here and uh, the focus of today. Um, really great to uh, hear your views and your thoughts on how we can keep moving forward. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Big thank you to you, Vicky. A few questions have come through for you. Uh, you mentioned that New Zealand has a comparative advantage in moving to a circular economy. Can you please expand on this? What are the comparative advantages that we have? Um, well, uh, on the, um, well, on the uh, circular economy side, uh, we have a comparative advantage, uh, which is that we're at the beginning of our waste journey. So we actually can uh, decide where to invest, uh, what to invest in. We can't send waste overseas anymore, so we can actually develop up what that is here. Uh, on the bioeconomy side, well, actually, it, you know, we've got a whole lot of natural resource uh, waste, for example, in wood. Uh, what, why, how could we use that differently, and what do we invest in there to, um, to actually take advantage of that? Okay. Uh, what are the learnings from Europe's journey to decarbonisation that we can take on? Europe's? Europe's journey. Yeah, um, so in some respects, I think um, Europe, Europe has taken quite a strong regulatory approach. So lots of, uh, a lot more rules than we have taken. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is just the pace of change that's, that's created in some areas. Um, so we can, you know, when we talk about what's the right tool here, is it price, is it regulation, or is it investment? I think there are some lessons there from Europe uh, that we might want to think about. Uh, and also there's some uh, probably lessons we, we don't want to take uh, in terms of New Zealand society. What is the total cost for carbon zero and how is this going to be financed over the decades? <coughs> well, actually, I'll, do, I'll answer that in a different way. The Climate Commission uh, answered that by saying what's the total cost of not uh, achieving action? Uh, and they put that down uh, to... Um, uh, uh, actually, it's a bigger cost to the economy to not not do this, and I can't remember the figure off my top of my head. But uh, in terms of our figures that we've done in modelling, it's about a 1% reduction in GDP over the lifetime of these budgets. <coughs> um, the, the Commission said there's actually uh, benefits as well. So, Just so you know, I've swallowed the wrong way, so apologies for the voice. <coughs> um, we will leave it there, though. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, Vicky Robertson, Secretary Thank for the you. Environment, Ministry for the Environment. Appreciate the time. <coughs> So we're going to move now to Susan Freeman Green, Chief Executive, Local Government New Zealand, reimagining the future of local government. We know that local government has felt a little bit under the pump recently, so let's hear what Susan has to say. Welcome. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Susan Freeman Green, tōko 
It's fantastic to be here. Thank you, Ainsley. Um, thanks for the insights, um, Nicole and Vicky. It's always interesting hearing you speak. And hi, Craig, <laughs> and everyone else. Uh, I really like the boldly optimistic theme of the session. I'm just looking for my clicker. I think there's a clicker here. Ah, is my, are my slides up? Yes. Right, OK. Um, thriving nations enabled by world-class infrastructure. It's aspirational. It's also very hard. Reimagining the future for local government is a critical part of that because it doesn't just rely on what we build or the services we deliver, the what, but equally importantly, the how. How we will work together and make the shifts needed to get this sustainable world infrastructure we're all talking about. That means navigating a complex web of relationships, sectors, BAU, investment requirements, cost pressures, and vastly competing priorities, not to mention politics. I have a couple of lenses when I think about this mahi. I came into this role from Engineering New Zealand with our vision of engineering better lives for New Zealanders. One of the things we focused on is that the end game isn't the infrastructure or the engineering, it's how it improves people's lives. In this job, what strikes me is that mayors and councillors frequently stand for election because they want to make a real difference to their communities, to their well-being, but they arrive to find that they're actually running great big infrastructure businesses and they're not always expecting that. As the membership body for councils, local governments New Zealand's role is to advocate on behalf of the national interests of the sector and its communities, which means putting local democracy at the front and center of everything we do. As we aspire to have the most active and inclusive local democracy in, in the world. And when we think about inclusiveness, I'm really um, mindful of what Nicole said about social license and how we make sure we have everyone's voice in, in the decisions we make. But that's where the future for local government must be, by and for the communities we serve. And when we think about sustainable infrastructure, in the context of local government. Apart from sustainable funding, which is a major issue, there are two other challenges. One, how we genuinely commit to long-term sustainable infrastructure in the context of three-year electoral cycles. And secondly, how we really get communities to value resilience and sustainability when the risks or the opportunities are not immediately obvious. Today I'm going to touch on three concepts that seem to me central when we think about the shifts we need to make, meet these challenges. First, and it's been mentioned before, we need to put people first. Second, putting people first means recognising that the system, the webs of networks that will produce sustainable, resilient infrastructure must be seen and viewed in the context of place. And third, how local government sits at a unique nexus in those networks and is actually central to taking these visions forward. Linked to that, of course, uh, are the massive reforms the sector is facing and the impact they're having on how we think about infrastructure in the future for local government, which I'll come back to. So when we uh, think about infrastructure, uh, What's our first image? Is it actually networks or roads or fibre or electricity, or is it people? And if we do have people in the mix, are they individuals or are we thinking more of a community, a collection of people brought together by place, whether that's somewhere you live or work or are travelling to or through? Because people experience infrastructure in the context of place. We sometimes think of ourselves as digital citizens, but in reality, the places we live and work shape our days and shape our moods. 
I know it's a completely different experience to be ready for work and to um, get in my car and have plenty of time and sit in a congested traffic jam, then be ready for work, have plenty of time, and then walk along an attractive waterfront. Uh, but, but despite the fact that we're physical beings, we do take infrastructure for granted. New stuff quickly becomes invisible to us. Uh, my excitement at zooming down Transmission Gully will be tomorrow's mundane commute, or perhaps even more likely, tomorrow's traffic jam. Infrastructure shapes our behaviour even as we fail to acknowledge its presence. And over time it evolves our places, it connects them and changes how they make us feel. Which is why it's really important to put infrastructure in the context of place, because that's how we experience it. When I became immersed in this world of local government, I started to see place in this other dimension, not only as a place that gives us our sense of belonging and identity, but also as a framework to deliver services it both shapes and is shaped by its people. So infrastructure actually benefits from being viewed through a place lens. And a place has multiple components. It's physical, it's natural, it's social, economic, and cultural uh, components. And all of these intersect to generate its essence. When you see concepts of infrastructure, it's often in sharp detail like a bridge or a road, and the rest of the image recedes in a blurred fashion. That's the opposite of how we should be conceiving it. We must sight it in place because that's how people experience it. But sighting infrastructure in place makes it harder. It makes delivery harder. The less bespoke, the cheaper. The more universal, the more straightforward. But anyone involved in delivery knows that off-the-shelf really works in the context of place, and that paying attention to that early on and the people who bring it to life needs to be done up front. And that goes to the how. Because putting people, in, people first and thinking about infrastructure in place means involving the whole infrastructure ecosystem. And if we could focus refocus away from silos and the detached ways of working in components towards connected communities, connected communities, imagine what would be possible. But how do we do that? How do we say, unite around a visual vision, bring people in and have them see their role in whatever context they are in? Things are easy to say. Uh, but much harder to achieve, as a number of people have already referred to. Uh, we can do it in a crisis, like the post-Christchurch um, rebuild, but how do we do it when the crisis isn't immediate, but 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years away, or when part of the work, part of the mahi, involves not doing things or preempting things rather than creating things, which is really important in sustainability. It takes leaning in early with all the players, leaning into the competing priorities, leaning into the conflict, leaning into the time investment early. And if we don't do it, we pay the price, usually in more time, more cost, and more conflict. Councils in this mix have a unique role to play, both now and in the future because they are the guardians of our places, not just in terms of infrastructure, but in terms of their community's well-being. And they're at the centre of this web of place. They make their decisions in consultation with communities. So it's really important, though, isn't it? Because while what they do, what councils do, is critical to you and your consultation, your community, how often do you participate in those processes. How can we make it easier? How can we, how can we make it easier? How can we get that better? How can we include the people that Nicole talked about um, that uh, are not part of the noisy um, minority on either side of the spectrum? 
So these are questions that are occupying not just LGNZ but councils. What do we choose to prioritise together? How do we put more participative democracy into action in a way that doesn't perpetuate or increase current inequalities in representation? We often use local voice as shorthand for that concept, the views and feelings and wants of people in the place. Democratic societies ignore local voice at their peril, whether in designing infrastructure or anything else. Because local voice is a vital expression of community wellbeing. That's wellbeing in the broader sense. Social, economic, environmental, cultural. These four wellbeings sit at the core of council's reason for being. And reimagining the future for local government in all its complex uncertainty means looking at both what local government and central government in the context of te Riti and with Māori iwi and mana whenua might do differently with our places so that our communities thrive. And that, and it's that local voice that's at the heart of Council's concerns about the current reforms. Three Waters is obviously the most challenging and challenged of these right now. Yep, it's unhelpfully politicised, it's been weaponised with some disturbing racial undertones and the full range of other hot points, some driven by genuine misunderstanding, some driven by misinformation, and some deliberately mischievous. We're seeing this community divisiveness putting pressure on councils, both elected members and staff. They're being targeted by mass email campaigns, often hostile and aggressive. Some councils have had to bring security guards into meetings for the first time ever. It's hard, and we're only just starting the select committee feedback process. Just this morning, I've heard from one of our team at LGNZ, a member organisation who's been um, absolutely harangued and um, put under pressure for a, a, a broader anti-LGNZ campaign. But when you strip the rhetoric away, and when I speak to councils on the ground, what I hear most often is their concern about losing the community threads that come from their interactions with water infrastructure. Just about all councils know change is needed to enable investment, to build resilience against the daunting challenges we face environmentally. But most are also struggling to see how the government's model will allow that critical local voice feedback loop and the integrated connections across the rest of the infrastructure system. And as much as anything else, uh, how it fits in with the resource management system, the re resource management reform. Because as Vicky's just described, we're also looking at the most significant resource management reforms in a generation. And like Three Waters, nearly everyone agrees the status quo isn't working, the RMA is complex, slow moving, frustrating, with uh, decisions too often likely to end up in court. But the change that's coming also feels very complex with some key differences from the current regime, including greater regionalisation of planning functions. And, and for our councils, they are concerned about how they will have um, direct communication to their planning, their work, as they go about what they're doing. So getting local voice input will again be critical. And seeing this alongside other infrastructure networks, works, thinking about the future we want um, and making sure everything's joined up is a really key focus for us. Both three waters and resource management will potentially change council's roles. So it makes sense that the government is also examining the future for local government. In an ideal world, this work would have come first, but we don't operate in an ideal world. There is a really strong connection, though, between the Three Waters reform, resource management reforms, and the Future for Local Government review. And we think there is significant risk and unintended consequences of these all proceeding without full information about how they work together. The Future for Local Government review must also look at the funding dilemmas that councils face with growing unfunded mandates and little ability to adjust revenue to meet them 
especially when adjusting revenue, one of the few levers that councils have means raising rates, which is really popular at the polls. But we're going to have to face into these hard questions, which means we're going to have to think about doing some hard change, otherwise letting it happen by default. Good sustainable infrastructure, as we know, and which is the topic here, is intergenerational, as are its costs. And we do have to think about what future generations will be paying for the investment decisions we make today. When the Alpine Fault strikes, which decision makers will have regrets? Because it's not just climate change that's tomorrow's infrastructure and resilience challenge. And how do we work across the spectrum to be good ancestors? That's my reform slide. Uh, infrastructure decisions with people at their heart are the ones that stick. Thinking from a place base, a whole systems base, an ecosystem base, an interconnected base is what is going to improve our decisions. They are the ones that we're going to be proud of in 20, 50 years' time. Because for all the differences in our pictures of a reimagined future for Aotearoa and for local government and for all our communities, founded on an awesome infrastructure, there will be fundamental commonalities and there will be trade-offs. So one of our jobs is to help people and communities understand the trade-offs, help them think about future generations, and for us to lose our silos and see our infrastructure as a system and network that comes to life in place, where everyone feels at home, calls places home, thrives in their communities, in the places that matter to them. That's as much about the how as the what. Kia ora. All right, thank you very much, Susan. Um, it was really interesting to hear you talking about Three Waters and the fact that it's been weaponised uh, and that the reactions have, have sort of ranged from misunderstanding to the mischievous. People have had to have security. Tell us more about, about that. Uh, well, we, yeah, I mean, uh, South Island Council is, is, is having to have um, security in its meetings because they're concerned about some threats that they are receiving from um, the community. There are petitions uh, around the elections, which are in October, local government elections are in October. If you don't know that, please put that in, please vote. <laughs> please think about who you want. Um, there's just a wee pitch for vote 2022. Um, it's, it's, you know, local government mayors, councillors have always been subject to some uh, harassment and online stuff, but it's got worse. It's ratcheted up a whole lot more and it's physical um, in, a, in a pretty nasty way. Um, yeah, I've heard some pretty grim stories about that and I'm not seeing much lessening of it. I think we all have a responsibility to do something about that, call it out. You also um, talked about, at the beginning of your talk, about the, the notion that when you became more immersed in local government, uh, you realised there's not one view, that actually this is uh, a place that delivers services and identity. Yeah. Can you expand on that? Yeah, well, you know, how we feel about where we live, the, how, it, how it looks, it feels, how we move between the places we work and play, how we... Uh, experience in the art, the public spaces, the parks, uh, are all so much at the heart of, of place and what makes our communities thrive and what makes people feel like they belong. How we work with our partners, how we, how we, um, how we connect um, with our partners in central government, with iwi, um, how we join, how we celebrate, how we um, think about being good citizens, they're all so relatable to where we live. And one thing I would also say, I mean, I've been in this role for 18 months now, is that, um, you know, quite a lot of people say to me, so why, you, why? <laughs> why have you done it? You know, like, look at the headache you have. <laughs> and, um, you know, from day one, yes, there's an awful lot of challenge. There's an awful lot of hard stuff and probably 
you know, I would, I would not be, I would be, I would be lying if I realised exactly what was coming up, even though we could see the reforms. However, there are some incredible, talented, committed um, councillors and mayors who, and staff in these councils who do unbelievable work for your communities, that it's just so invisible. And I think that story needs to be so much more elevated and so much the heart of what the future for local government should be. Big round of applause, please, for Susan Freeman. <laughs> Uh, Susan talked about that notion that off-the-shelf really works, and, and again, it gets back to what everybody's been talking about today, which is that people are at the heart of everything that is done, of all the decisions that are made. Uh, councils have a unique role to play. Democracy ignores local voice, the local voice at its peril. And of course, when we talked about Three Waters, uh, Susan said, when you strip the rhetoric away, council staff don't want to lose community threads through dealing with water infrastructure. So how does the government framework allow for that local voice. And one big question towards the end, she asked, how do we act as good ancestors? How do we act now as good ancestors? Thank you very much again, Susan. I'd like to welcome back now Craig Davidson for uh, a session reflection as we begin to wind up towards our first break of the day. Round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Muriyama. It's, um, it's kind of hard to do a session reflection after you do such a wonderful job of um, touching on those high points. But I do want to kick off with a big thank you to, to our speakers for providing some, some real insights into the challenges their organisations are facing. And they are big challenges. But also, you know, I was really pleased and excited by the proactive steps that are being taken, both within the organisations, but also in, in reaching out to partner firms and the common theme that we are in this together. Now, I'm mindful that I stand between you and some great networking opportunities. I do have pages and pages of, um, of, of notes taken, um, which I might struggle to, um, to read my own handwriting. But, but very briefly, you know, for, for Nicole, you know, she, she made the comment that you know, we haven't been good tenants, and we do need to, to be better in that space. And I think Wakatahi you know, are genuinely committed to making that change to driving sustainable outcomes. We talked about the sustainability action plan to to reduce emissions, and we heard from Minister Wood as well, talking about 20% reduction in vehicle kilometres travel, 35% reduction in freight, um, improve public health and reduce the environmental harm. Great aspirational goals, and they're, and they're looking to achieve that through matching the funding to changing the investment mix and you know, using networks differently, and I think that goes into that change that we're going to have to have as people. We're going to have to do things differently if we are going to deliver on those goals. Walking and cycling, mass transit, digital, a multi-pronged approach. But I think the, you know, the key thing for me was, again, the behavioural change that is required for all of us and for us as a group to, um, to lean into. Um, for Vicky, um, the importance of investment certainty, you know, that it's a collective challenge that no one organisation can solve. Talked about the work done in the adaption and resilience space that as a country we've gone through and we've looked at our risks and they are significant, coastal, agricultural, um, you know, weather, the inequality challenge. So, you know, we've got line of sight on what the challenges are for us as a country and then you start the next step on the adaptation plan and talked about how do we reduce infrastructure vulnerability and there's a real cost to that. There's also a massive cost to the managed retreat, and that's a conversation that, that we need to be bold in. There are parts of this country that we do need to consider the future of, particularly when you look at infrastructure and its cost, and that's a conversation. And again, I think we need to be at the forefront in. The emissions reduction plan, the fact that the ETS provides a fund for changing the way and investing in how we do sustainability better. And then lastly, the conversation around the RMA. The fact that the, the legislation, the existing legislation, has worked for no one, it's going to be replaced by three new pieces of legislation. Um, the challenge is the devil's in the detail. And for those of us who were around when the RMA came in, you know, there was a lot of you know, inertia and a lot of challenges around it when, it when it came in. Let's hope that the transition to this new legislation is slightly, slightly smoother. 
Lastly, Susan. Um, oh, look, I don't envy um, Susan her challenge. I thought she had a challenge with engineering New Zealand. Um, but, you know, the challenges facing local government are, are massive. But it's such an important part of the fabric of our society. You know, that challenge around long-term thinking versus three-year election cycles. And for community buy-in to resilience for infrastructure that, by and large, people think about it when a ribbon's opened, forget about it, particularly the infrastructure that's under the ground. The reforms that are, that are going on, how we can, how we can help um, tell that story. You know, I think the, the comment made about let's lean in together, it's that people theme that came, came through. And lastly, I thought the comment around, you know, the need to think holistically about local government. We seem to be picking off, you know, little items one at a time without that macro plan as to where we want to go as a country. So some fantastic um, speakers, some, some, you know, some real challenges, and I'm sure in the afternoon session as we move forward, we will talk about how we can, how we can address some of those challenges. Look before, before.